Well, hang on a second. Of course, we're going to have technical difficulties now. Hey, Lazelle, you took me back uh, to Queen B back in the day. <laughs> it says meeting is now streaming. Okay. Yeah, You're on. That's one of my favorites, man. <laughs> okay. Okay. So are we ready to roll? Yes. yes. Did it? Okay. Good. Good evening. You are joining Conversations Around the Table, and this is a special live show uh, talking about COVID-19 and how it affects the African-American community. Uh, first, I would like to say I am Deborah Logan Lawson, and we have a roundtable discussion with others as they will introduce themselves. I'm uh, Patrick yeah. Mitchell, uh, better known as Friday with uh, The Kiss of Life. Also with the Lextropolis and uh, photographer. I'm Jamin, Joy Bolton Berry. <laughs> I'm the half of the dope duo from the joys and lows of relationships. Hi, I'm Trina. I'm a co-host of Urban Conversation. I'm Lizelle Lowe, AKA Zello the other half of the dope duo of the joys and lows of relationships and co-host of Key Conversations Radio. All right, I'm Kevin Hall. I'm the communications officer at the Lexington Bay County Health Department. I am usually a co-host of Healthy Times on Radio Lex. It has been put on a bit of a hold indefinitely as we respond to COVID-19, but we have been happy to participate in other conversations like the one tonight with conversations around the table. So thanks for letting us be a part of this. And I'm Mark Royce. I'm the general manager of Radio Lex. I am so excited to have so many of our great hosts from the radio station here in one show live. Uh, these folks have done amazing work. They uh, are so creative and they bring so much to the radio station. And I'm honored to be in a virtual room with them all tonight. And I'm gonna now sit down and be quiet and let uh, Deborah take over. <laughs> did Dale introduce himself? Oh, Dale, did you? Yes. And, uh, also, I'm the other uh, part of the conversation around the table, co-host co along with Deborah Logan Lawson. My name is Dale Morgan. Okay, okay. Welcome, welcome, and welcome. Uh, as I stated earlier, we're going to uh, be talking about COVID-19 and how it affects um, black and brown communities. None of us pretend to be experts on this, except for Kevin Hall. <laughs> I'm not um, even gonna be all... an expert. <laughs> <laughs> but we all do re represent uh, various areas of our community, specifically the black and brown communities. So with all of that being said, um, Kevin, won't you first start off telling us about the coronavirus? Yeah, uh, well, again, thank you for letting us talk about this. This is such a fantastic way to reach a wide audience, uh, not only can participate in Lexington, but for anybody who wants to watch family members across the country, uh, because this what's happening in Lexington is really no different than what we're seeing in many other places. Uh, COVID-19, coronavirus, we'll hear it in different names. The health department tries to stick with COVID-19 because that is the official name and then what the CDC uh, uses. Uh, it's, it first hit in Kentucky on March 6th. I still can't wrap my head around that. It's, it's barely been a month ago. We're, we're, I don't think we're even at six weeks yet. Uh, but on March 7th and 8th is when we started, uh, when we had our first cases here in Lexington. So it's all on one weekend. And since then, we are now up to, I'm checking the numbers right now, we have 213 confirmed cases of COVID-19. And it is, it's an illness that is affecting everyone. It is, we're seeing a little bit of an easier time right now because the flu and some of these other respiratory illnesses aren't out there. So it's a little easier to distinguish the symptoms because the, it's fever, cough, sore throat, all those things that you're gonna get during the winter months all those things happening at once. So it was really difficult to distinguish between what was the flu and what was the coronavirus. Uh, it's been a very, very busy few weeks here at the health department going through this because initially we started with a person test positive for it. 
you interview that person, then you find out what circle they've been around, who all they've been, they've been in close contact with, and you, you do contact tracing to try to find out. It's like police work, you're doing an investigative piece. Once it got to a certain level, we couldn't we couldn't contain it. We, it was gonna it was out there. It was spreading uh, beyond uh, people who were just in high risk areas. So we moved to what's called the mitigation phase, which means that we're only doing the contact tracing and that level of investigation for some of the high risk groups like healthcare workers because they come face to face with so many people. So that's where we are right now. And uh, the good news is, it seems it could be slowing down. The numbers, I think I'm looking here, we've had uh, around 20, uh, about 25 cases, uh, new cases in the last week. We're not out of the woods yet. Right now, we're chalking this up to it was a there was a slowdown in people getting tested because of the Easter weekend, but we hope that it's also because of people staying at home and listening to those social distancing and physical distancing guidelines. Okay, I I watched uh, our governor speak moments ago, and I did hear him say that tomorrow the numbers are more likely to grow just because of the reasoning that you just stated. What, uh, does anyone else have something they wanna say? I, I, uh, well, I, I don't know what your question was gonna be, Deborah, but uh, in reference to uh, Kevin, uh, and thank you for that information. Um, depending on what your question is, Deborah, could he expand on what the process is to get tested? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, and that's changing because there are more private providers and more places that are doing the testing. And I know it's something that we're on talks with. The health department, to be clear, does not offer testing. We are not doing testing here, but we work with places to help identify the spots where and people who are doing testing. The way it has been so far, because tests are so hard to come by, there is a scarcity of tests is it needs to be somebody who has then been in a high risk group or somebody that initially had traveled to some place where it had been a large number of cases. Now, because it's everywhere, uh, that's not so much really one of the questions that comes up because you could go almost anywhere in the US and there are cases. But we're looking at uh, the people who were getting tested early on were people who were showing a showing the symptoms or, uh, and then B, we're part of our most vulnerable populations. And that's been people who are 60 years of age or older, or people who have underlying health conditions, such as heart, kidney, and lung issues. Uh, if, it, if somebody got, uh, if, for instance, if I tested positive and I was in close contact with somebody else and they started showing those symptoms, they would be tested as well. Uh, but it's, it's all, there's, it's, uh, Part of the investigation is to determine who would go get put on uh, the recommendation to be tested. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, I had a question too. Sure. Because, uh, when, this is in regards to the, the name of, of the, um, this, I hear coronavirus, uh, you hear COVID-19, but also I, I, what I'm curious about is why they call it the novel coronavirus, the novel coronavirus. So. Yeah, it's because it's new. And it's, uh, it's something we've never seen before. Now there are, you'll, you'll hear people say that, well, I tested for positive for coronavirus two years ago. And that's, for, or early on, we saw people on the bot backs of the Lysol bottles. They would right. say it says it can treat coronavirus. That's because that covers a large number of illnesses of those respiratory illnesses. So, uh, you know, Corona is crown and head. So those are those viruses of your, your head and your, and your breathing. But this is one we've never seen before, and that it so it was a novel coronavirus. Hey, Kevin, I got a question for you. As it relates to the testing, is going to be a big part of when we can get out of this um, mitigation. Get you know probably keeping social distancing, but at least people can get out. If if we're only testing people that present for symptoms. Um, is there something that Kentucky is going to do to be able to massively test people before we get out of this? Um, because my understanding is there could be some people that are carriers that don't even know that they're carriers. Asymptomatic. Uh, there's something I really can't speak to fully because I just don't know all of the information on that. And it's a great question. 
and it is part of the the the, the balance of trying. It's why we've talked about it's too soon for people to really make full predictions on when this will end and when we can open back up. Now, just prior to this conversation starting, uh, I saw that the president has talked about the governors and other states will now have the ability to they'll make the plan on when they can reopen. And some of the uh, states surrounding Kentucky, Ohio, for instance, are looking at May 1st is when they are going to open in phases. It's not just going to be a flip the switch and the state or the country goes back to what it was. It will be in some phases. Uh, but it, it is the lack of testing that causes some issues. And so, no, of course, no state, no city wants to go too far in advance on saying we're going to be open until that widespread testing or at least a larger scale number of tests are available. And do we know why we don't have that number of tests available with the university being a tier one research institution right in our backyard? Yeah, I, I can't speak on behalf of any of the providers. I just know it's we're not alone here. And uh, it seems like a lot of the tests are going to the places where there's the heaviest uh, numbers being hit, you know, your places like New York City. It doesn't lessen the impact on places like Lexington. The people of Lexington are just as important as the people anywhere. But because the resources are spread so thin, it's causing some issues. It's a good question. So, so have we reached the peak of this? Are we in the midst of the peak of it? I know a couple of weeks ago they were saying that this, you know the next two weeks was going to be the peak of all of this. So I, I'm just asking, are we in the midst of it now, or is it more to come? Well, and it's a great question, Deborah, and it's one that we get often. And if you ask 100 people who work in public health, you're going to get probably 90 to 99 different answers because everybody has a different statistical model, it appears. At the Lexington Bay County Health Department, we are not offering any sort of prediction on when we'll see that peak, just simply because it is a changing situation. Our Commissioner of Health, Dr. Craig Humbaugh, he likes to describe that we're flying the plane as we build it. Uh, because it, what, and, and for example, three, three weeks ago, as recently as three weeks ago, we were saying the following the CDC guidelines on not wearing masks out in public because that's what the CD recommendation was. But as additional studies came, the CDC changed that recommendation. And now everyone who goes out and can't physically distance is recommended to wear that mask. So that is, it's one of the challenges, if not the biggest challenge in this, is we're learning as we go. What we do hope, though, is that the people who are following, because we're following these guidelines, that people are staying in, they're washing their hands, they're doing the things that you hear us say, the governor say, you're hearing it from our community leaders, it's working, and it'll get us out of this a lot faster. Yeah, that's a great segue into a question that I wanted to ask um, as well concerning wearing masks. We all know mm -hmm. that it is uh, very difficult to find, you know, the kinds of masks that, that people are used to seeing, hospital masks mm -hmm. or other ones. And so now you see this influx of individuals that are making uh, these homemade masks. And so can you talk to us about, um, you know, what would make them more effective if they are effective in the first place? Yeah, and that's a great question. And you're right that these aren't the masks that you see a, a nurse or a medical provider wearing. Those are very special masks, and that's why there's a shortage of those. It's the N95 masks that you hear, and they have to be, you have to be fit tests for that. Uh, I would have to shave my facial hair off before I could wear properly wear one of the N95s. What you're talking about and what most people see, you go out today, go to a grocery store, people are wearing these homemade masks. And first of all, this question came up yesterday in a chat we had, and a person said, if I don't have anything available in my home, what can I do? Anything is going to be better than nothing. A scarf, if you have a winter scarf and you can wrap it around your face, go ahead and do that. You just want to make sure it's breathable. You don't want to make it where you can't breathe when you're out. And you want to cover your nose and you want to cover down to your chin. So as long as you're getting that covered, that's going to be better than nothing. Uh, and the big, and it's worth noting that this isn't to keep you from catching the illness. This is to keep you from spreading it to others. Because as was mentioned earlier, the big, big fear right now, one of the biggest issues is that I could be carrying it and have no symptoms and then be spreading it on to someone else. So the mask that I wear in public, 
when I go to my, make my grocery store run once a week, it is to protect other people who I might come into contact with. But if you've got a bandana, a handkerchief, if you've got an old t-shirt, there are steps that you can take to fold those. Uh, I, I know a lot of people are folding them so it's three layers of the fabric. You can uh, fasten rubber bands so that they fit in and fit on your ears. Uh, we're going to be working, one of the things we're working on at the health department is we're going to have one of our employees just walk around their house and start looking at, I can turn this into a mask. I can turn this into a mask. So it's things that you already have in your home. So you don't have to go out and spend money that you could be using on something else. Okay, we're going to stop right here for a few minutes and take a short break. Okay, Mark, are we ready to go? Yes, Deborah. Okay, what I want to get into on this um, next segment is, again, we wanted to talk about the African American community. And many of us have been out and about this past couple of weeks, and we see so many, we were seeing a lot of gatherings in barbecues over the holiday weekend and different things. I don't think we're taking it serious. And I just kind of want to talk about that. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, that's a good question because I was hoping that we would start getting into um, some of the conversation about um, you know what we see in our own personal city and, and in our own personal view. And I thought maybe we could roll it back to and the others can chime in, roll it back to our initial thoughts and thinking on when it came about. You know, we had this, um, we're immune to it. Uh, they're lying to us, uh, all of that. So I think, you know, we might need to kind of peel back on why we are so um, hesitant to trust the things that are being told to us and how when that information took over social media and, and why there was, in my opinion, a lackluster uh, response uh, from maybe our leaders to say, hold on, you know, this could, you know, we need to really kind of look at this. So if anybody wanted to give their opinion on, you know, why, um, and I'm not saying right or wrong, but just kind of have a discussion on why we had that initial thinking and why we had that uh, initial sweep of social media that said that, you know, we were immune to it. I think, um, hello? Yeah, can you hear yes. me? Was that future? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Can you see me? No. That's crazy. <laughs> I, you know, I have never done a Zoom, so I'm trying. But if you can hear me, I'll get the video up in a second. But in order to uh, kind of pick it back on what Joy was talking about, I'm thinking that, you know, we've always had this mentality simply because we really don't trust the system. So anytime something goes down like that, you know, if there's, uh, you know, it's always a conspiracy theory. And we assume as African-Americans that, uh you know, we may be invincible or maybe some kind of ploy against us to try to, uh, you know, maybe think that or maybe make us think that, uh, uh, you know, that we just feel like that we just are invincible in a way that, you know, because, you know, we've had this mentality of our melanin is so, it's almost like supernatural. So can not penetrate it. And we've had to endure so much over all these years that we've had to, you know, we've had so much uh, trauma, you know, over what hundreds of years. And so we think that we're invincible. So naturally when we see when they were coming out with the statistics and saying specific to what the ethnicity was of uh, who was catching it, we assume naturally that it wasn't going to be us, you know, that we are these super, uh, superhumans, if you will, you know, and because of that, I think, you know, uh, we kind of uh, took for granted that that was going to be something that wasn't going to be included in us. So I, I don't know, but I just know that, that with that mentality, a lot of people assuming that it put us in a situation where people just kept, you know, socializing and congregating and not realizing they were actually passing it on to each other. 
So I, I, you know, that's I what I think. feel. I actually feel the total opposite. Yeah. I don't think that they felt like my our melanin made us superhuman or anything like that. I believe it was the st statistics that were first seen, and they noticed that Africa had very few cases when a lot of the other places around Africa had many, many cases, and Africa had three, five cases when it first started. So I believe that's where that mentality came from that maybe African-Americans are not affected as harshly. But then what we see is these underlying issues, most African-Americans carry those underlying issues because of poor health care for each other. Though, so when you talk about hypertension, we're the worst in hypertension. When you talk about diabetes, we're the worst in diabetes. So of course, I feel like our numbers were going to raise and it doesn't hurt any to influctuate them anymore to make it seem like, there's my partner, to make it seem <laughs> yeah. like, hey, you know, now it's a big, Af it's a big thing in the African-American culture. And it may be to make us more aware, but I don't think African-Americans gathered, and again, personal thoughts, as much as whites gathered. So I, I don't think it was so much as, oh, we didn't ignore, we didn't think we could be harmed, so we gathered, we kicked it. I think a lot of America gathered and kicked it, you know, and that, that's the result yeah. of what we see now. Well, Trina, I, I, I kind of agree with both you and Future. I think the first piece of it was, um, as you all stated before, when we first heard about this virus hitting, which was, a, and I'm in a healthcare arena, we heard about it in about December, okay? And then, of course, it was confirmed in January um, in, in China. And again, you're talking about a whole other country, right? That's, you know, a million light, light years away. No one's thinking about anything that affects China would necessarily affect America. Right. But when it came to America, it hit a state where there are very few African-Americans. It hit Washington state. And then the population that it hit were people that were probably over 65 because they were in a nursing home, if you guys remember. But this right. is the second part of that that happened. Social media has a way of, in my opinion, dumbing down our community. And we can just say what we want to, however we want it. I started seeing people, famous people posting that because of the melanin in our skin, we couldn't get it. And then you just started hearing this just rampantly go throughout the community that black folks couldn't get COVID-19. And what happened was I think that sometimes, and I tell, I try to teach my sons this and, I, and people that know me, you'll hear me say this, verify your source who told you that we can't get it and so what would happen is is that people could never really verify future where they heard that from so it just became one of those old spirituals that we just handed down in language to tell people you can't get it because you're black so to right. go back to joy's point when it really got serious and, and i i can only speak for me when it really got serious which was about um in kentucky and everyone would attest to this it was during the sec tournament when they finally canceled it, everyone started to really take notice because you know we always have a tendency to go to Atlanta or go to Nashville to watch the Cats play. That's when I really began, for me, that it set in that, hey, this is extremely serious. And I'm in the healthcare arena. But what happened was, Joy's right. I think a lot of people still did not take the CDC guidelines, did not take Governor Bashir at his word when they started raising the flag. And because, and, um, 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 Kevin, you can, you can attest to this, you know, I think there's a lag sometimes when people necessarily are exposed and when they become symptomatic. And so maybe we were out having barbecues. Maybe we were still socializing, as Joyce said, and we weren't really listening. But what happened is it started to then, uh, as Trina said, show its face in our community because we have a lot of comorbidities. We have a lot of underlying issues. Now, the question is, Joy and everyone on this panel, have we taken it seriously now that we see that it is truly affecting the black community? And this is an equal opportunity killer, whether you black, white, uh, I got a statistic last night that it's now affecting Latinos at a higher rate. So are we paying attention to it? I guess that's the question that I would ask the panel now. Are we now paying attention to it now that we know it's a killer in our community? And, and let me put a disclaimer out that I wasn't uh, like uh, trying to say anything negative about our people, people in our communities, because I think it's still, you can still roll back on why we feel the way we do. There is valid historical facts about how we've been mistreated, you know, from this country. Um, and so, yes, I can understand 
the reason why we, some of us are thinking the way we're thinking and that comes from the effects of you know, racism. And so that is a whole big old conversation um, to take place. But I, I feel for us because if we are still feeling the effects of racism and mistreatment in this country, look at how, look at what it's doing to us. When these things come out, even we had famous people that were saying, you know, who's the interest, who said I had it. We were still saying, oh, he's lying. They're paying him to, you know, say that. And so we were still kind of iffy uh, about it. But I still, you know, even to be thinking about the effects of racism on us, even now and, and how it has, you know, it's, it's destroying us. We're now we're trying to catch up and trying to be safe and trying to make sure our numbers, you know, are, are lower and, and et cetera. So I just want to put a disclaimer out, out there that I wasn't talking bad about our people. I just wanted to say, look at the effects of, it, of what's been happening to us historically. I don't think any of us are trying to say anything negative about our communities. We just want to put the facts out here. We want to educate them, educate ourselves about what is necessary to take care of ourselves because people are dying and we are dying at alarming rates. Um, Joe and I, you and I had a conversation where you say, what are we doing now, Lizelle? Are we taking it seriously? And I still, in some places, don't see us taking it seriously. We're going to the store with two, with two or three people of the families with kids and we're not covered up. I mean, those are issues that we need to take a look at and we need to be doing to protect our kids and our families. You know, I, I personally think that, uh, uh, now that I look back in hindsight, I think that uh, a lot of the reason why African Americans didn't think that they could get it at the gate was again, it's because they felt like because no, they had they really didn't put a face on it at the gate. You know, they right. Wuhan, China. You know, that's all they talked about was China. And so then when it started hitting, like I think it was up in uh, Washington State. You know, and the fact that they still didn't put a face on it, African Americans was just still assuming that. Hey man, you know, this ain't for us. It's not our disease or whatever. But I think it's just like anything else. I think that until it hits your threshold, you know, most people are concerned about it. I mean, people see the stuff that's going on, but when it starts hitting family members, you know, that's when I think it's going to hit home. When it starts hitting the personal friend that you have, that's when it's going to start hitting home. But until then, especially with these young people, if you look at them now, they still uh, still feel like they're invincible. If you, I've seen several, uh, uh, you know, like video where people are still congregating, hanging out, even this past Easter, you know, it was like, I seen groups of, of 50 and 100 people hanging out for like Easter uh, day uh, gatherings and all that. So I'm thinking until it hits them, they're not really going to feel the real effect of it. But somebody like me, who is uh, a high risk candidate, you know, immediately I got on it, you know, and I separated myself. I started social distancing early, you know, so Again, I think it's just it's going to take to have to, you know, unfortunately hit somebody in their, either their family or personal friend for a lot of these people to catch on, you know, and that's black, white or whoever. I went to the store today. I seen a bunch of people. They didn't have on masks. They didn't have on gloves. They were carefree. Even they had lines to get into the store and people were still acting as if nothing was really going on. And here I am. I'm nervous. I'm trying to get in and get out. You know, a guy with whatever I need specifics and get back to my house. But I see a lot of people, they walk like a duck and don't give a quack. I, I, I would like to pose a question to the panel. We keep hearing these reports about how uh, that the White House was briefed on, on this disease like three or four months ago. But you see the president was in the media constantly downplaying the threat. How do you feel like that that affected the way people's outlook on and or how they didn't take it really serious uh, um, about this COVID nineteen? That's for anybody. Well, I mean, I, well, um, it's a good question. I, what I was unfortunately, gonna... go ahead. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it kind of goes back to Lizelle's too. They kind of combine. I think that. Uh, a lot of us are misinformed and uh, there's a lot of fake news out there. So we don't know who to trust. Um, yeah, then it's coupled with the fact that we've got this uh, knucklehead in the uh, White House, it does make it difficult to trust and know the information. Um, I didn't hear about the Melanin conspiracy and I didn't hear about uh, 
the, the thing that got me was when they shut down Italy. And um, that's when I took it serious. And I'm in that high risk area too. Now my job, and I won't mention their name, but Amazon decided, you know, we're gonna stay open because we're essential and I respect that. But now we've got 10 people who tested positive. We're not getting the information about who they were, were we in that same area? How will it affect us? How would I get it? Um, and I think that that boils down into the community about not having the information. That's why this panel discussion is very good. Hopefully the information will get out there. But yeah, trust has been an issue even with the census. We are the last to respond to the census. Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to trust. I have a Enjoy. question. I do not feel like you're talking about the black community. You're doing a great job. Thank you, thank you, sir. I, I have a, I was going to pose a question to Kevin because you make yeah. a great point about what's going on uh, at uh, this place that you work with that you refuse to uh, give the name called Amazon. So I wanted uh, to <laughs> see funny, <laughs> if, if uh, Kevin could tell us, are, is the health department involved when we have these particular businesses that have employees that test positive? Okay, so yeah, I've got a few things, a few different pieces I want to respond to. I'll, let me get to yours directly. Uh, it this sounds like a cop out, but it depends because it, if it's a Lexington business, it just doesn't doesn't necessarily mean the Lexington Fayette County Health Department who's responding. It's the place of residence of the person it happens to. So if the person I, I live in Georgetown, so if the if I tested positive here at the Lexington Fayette County Health Department, it's going to be Scott County's Health Department, the Webco District, that does the investigation and not necessarily the Fayette County Health Department. And there are situations to where the employer would never know about it. If I were not, uh, if I were teleworking or had not been around anybody for the two week period, uh, there's a chance that they wouldn't have to tell my employer on it. So it's not as cut and dry as some people might think. Uh, on how, how it is with an employer. Now, that said, we have worked, tried to work closely. If a business, and we've had several businesses reach out to us, how can we, how can you work with us to, so we can provide services, but also maintain these guidelines? And so we've done that with several places. We've also responded to complaints. If it's a, some place that we regulate, like a restaurant, and we get feedback from the community, we'll go out there and tell them, you can't be doing this. And there are places where we've had to intervene. Uh, I wanna go back to what was said just prior to, and uh, I can't stress this enough, that this panel, you all are making such a difference. You are public health communicators in this because you're, you're taking the misinformation that you're hearing and you're spreading the actual facts. And so I can't put enough thanks to you on that. And we'll talk to you at any point at any time to help continue to get that information out there. Uh, something that came up earlier too was um, one of the reasons that people may not have been taking this seriously early on. And I want to just say from the health department end, we didn't start looking at the trends and the demographics until we had enough of the numbers to collect. You don't want to look, you don't want to make it assumptions about statistics until you have enough of the data. And then once we had enough cases, we realized just like New Orleans and Detroit, New York and some other major cities that it was disproportionately affecting African-Americans. Right now, out of our 213 cases, 29% are Black or African-American compared to 15% of Lexington's population. We've been having discussions, very public discussions with community leaders because it would be easy for us to say there's underlying conditions as you mentioned earlier, but that's not what we want to look at. We wanna look at the root problems of why underlying conditions exist, about why there are these systemic problems of why African-Americans have increased diabetes or increased health conditions. It's breaking down those barriers. So when you talk to that, see the health department talking about this, we're looking at it from a true public health standpoint. We are not just saying yeah, underlying conditions, of course, no, there are true reasons for this and we're getting a lot of great feedback and trying to take steps to address those, including conversations like this. Also cannot say enough that I appreciate Joy, you saying, and because we feel this way too, we are not seeing that African-Americans are doing anything wrong. You're right, everybody is congregating. It's, it's not just, this is not a, 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 a 
call out of African Americans in Lexington. What this is, is recognizing that these numbers aren't numbers, they're humans. They are, they are real people that we care about in Lexington. And, that, and when we hear us talk about the numbers, we only do that to provide data, but we recognize those are real, true humans behind that. And it's why we're stepping up to try to do uh, improve the outreach on this. And I thank you for allowing us to be able to do that to help break down some of those barriers. But you know, when you, talk, when you talk about, excuse me, when you talk about some of the um, uh, disproportionate numbers, you know, when you say that African Americans are seeing it or catching it more than anybody, you have to uh, consider the circumstances, you know, like, when you talk about a lot of these blue collar jobs, you know, that are considered essential jobs, you know, you still have all these African Americans that are in those positions, which means that them still going to work every day is exposing them more, you know, so that's the reason why the numbers are going up. And of course, those are, we have those comorbidity uh, issues that we have. Uh, but then when you talk about some of these other uh, areas, different states like uh, Detroit, uh, you know, even in New York where it's a densely populated area, you know, where you have people pretty much on top of people, especially in the kind of the, uh, I guess they would consider them the uh, uh, kind of low income areas, you know, you have, you know, people may live in an apartment building where you have 50 people or 100 people living in there where they're having close contact. So I think the fact that, uh, you know, African Americans still, uh, they work a lot of these blue collar jobs that are still considered essential workers or essential uh, uh, jobs or whatever. And then again, you still have these, uh, we have all these underlying health issues, you know, that's combining uh, on top of that. So I think when we talk about, uh, you know, the disproportionate numbers, it's because it's a lot of factors that play into it. And I don't know if everybody's considering those factors. Well, it's so. something that we are, we're having that conversation and because it's not, and we can't solve it obviously overnight because this is years and years, decades, centuries of problems. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to have, a, 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 to bring people to the table to say, what can we do now in the immediate situation we're in? But we're not stopping this conversation as soon as COVID disappears. It's looking at what we can do next steps and next steps and next steps to take care of everybody in Lexington. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, we had a conversation uh, two days ago, I believe, uh, time has no meaning in this response, it feels like, okay. but with some uh, pastoral and clergy of African-American churches, and one of the things they were talking to us about were a lot of what you already said here, the misinformation, the rumors, uh, and, and trying to, to use their power and establishment that, 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 figure, that the figures of trust in, in, in with their, their congregation to be able to speak directly to them. And we're providing now direct data to them and information and, and just little tidbits to help protect people. That's what we want is we want to keep you mentioned earlier that you were you were one of the high risk group. We want to keep you alive so we can continue to look at, at and be able to offer whatever other services you need moving forward. And that's the way we we're looking. So we want to help everyone stay safe from this. So, well, Karen, I, so let's take okay, a little okay. break here for a few minutes and before we continue this conversation and you are again listening to conversations around the table. And we will be right back. Good Great job. job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Bring we're back, guys. Great job, Deborah. We're back. We're back. To Deborah. We're <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <laughs> here. Urban conversations and joys and lows. The joys and lows of relationships and conversations around the table are meeting around the table for our Lexington uh, community. This has been a great conversation, um, but there's so much more that we need to get to. Um, to I kind of want to talk about self-isolation also. You forgot about the kiss of life. <laughs> yeah, don't oh, forget, the, don't I'm forget sorry. the kiss of life, yeah. The kiss. Friday. The kiss. <laughs> the kiss of life. <laughs> Hey, Deborah, before we go into that subject that you started, can we just finish up on the last thing that Kevin had mentioned about his um, conversations he had with the Black pastors? I think it's something that, that's been essential in our community, talking about um, the presence of, of, of our Black church. And I would just like to get everyone's opinion 
around the table because, um, as you all know, we Easter just ended last week, and we made national news again um, for church um, defying the governor's orders or wishes and having church and subsistence came Hill, from Hillcrest, New Jersey. Kentucky. In Hillcrest, Kentucky. Huh? In Hillcrest, Kentucky, I think. Yeah, sisters came all the way from New Jersey um, to be a part of that. And I just want to kind of get people's opinion on, you know, where you are. Let me give you what I think. You know, for me, this has been extremely difficult to be away from my church family at this time. But understanding the values, as Kevin talked about, and social distancing and being able to still connect via uh, Facebook Live or whatever platform is something we've been able to do. So, you know, I've missed it, but I haven't missed it to the detriment of where I wanted to go and get sick or get someone else sick. How, how, how do you guys feel about, you know, being away from your church home and what we saw in Hillcrest, Kentucky, as a future just mentioned? Uh, I'll go ahead and, and give a quick answer. Uh, I, I, from some of the pastors that I'm friends with via Facebook, they are really um, happy. I think we are reaching so many people and I, so many more people. Uh, when I go and, and, and probably from 8 a.m. till about noon, I have all kinds of online sermon services, worshiping that I can, can stream right into. And I see the numbers, uh, hundreds, hundreds of people are, are watching uh, these, services via online so as we may not be in the actual an actual church building I do believe that this pandemic this crisis is actually bringing people uh, closer together and bringing people um, uh, to churches and then I even had one pastor friend who said that the giving has even increased during this pandemic which people might think would be the opposite um, so, you know, it's unfortunate that I think some folks' egos will, you know, allow people to gather and, and risk getting people sick. And we already had proof where there was, I don't know how many, there were sick in one particular church and people were even dying. Um, Four people died. Yeah, that that, that, that that happens. But I think for me, the positive part of it, even from my own personal standpoint, is that I am, uh, that I have gained a closer relationship. And that during this crisis, I think, you know, a lot of people are, are gathering and, and watching and listening to, to God more. Okay, Future, what's your comment? I mean, I, you know, honestly, I don't frequent church. That's the honest truth, you know, and I've been to church several times, but I'm not someone who goes all the time. But, uh, you know, I, I don't personally understand how uh, a pastor or even a church goer would subject themselves to uh, any kind of harm, them and their family. You know, they want to gather their kids up and, you know, like the people that went uh, to church on Sunday, this past Sunday uh, for Easter. I just don't understand the mentality. We know if you are a true Christian, we know that church lives in you. You know, God lives in you. And if you have a personal relationship with God, not that church is not uh, important and uh, or that it's not necessary, but the fact that you would be in uh, aware of what's going on in the world, knowing that this pandemic is killing people. I just don't understand the mentality or how you think you're going to miss out on anything by protecting you and your family by not going to church. Like Jamin said, they have all kind of platforms that you can uh, tune in via so, uh, social media. You know, if you need to get that uh, uh, feeling of fellowship, you know, with different people, because you could do what we're doing right now. You know, some people are Zooming, you know, and having conversations about religion and church and all that thing. So I don't I don't understand the mentality of somebody who feels like they have to be in the church building because personally, I believe that church is in you as a person. If you believe in God and you are a devout Christian, you know, then you wouldn't put yourself in harm's way. God wouldn't want you to put yourself in harm's way. That's the way I feel about it. I agree with my I agree with my co-host on that, but here's the thing: Jim Jones also had Diana, 
people are going to follow. They're looking for something to follow. They're, some are new religious people and they're scared and a pandemic has hit and they don't know which way to run. And unfortunately, those are those, I believe what's going on now in the pandemic that's going on now as far as the church is bringing forth the true leaders of the church, the true forward thinkers of the church. Because what we know is the world as church as we knew it being 50 and older, you know, as we knew it is changing every day before pandemic even came. So at this point, now we want to know who our leaders are, who can touch, who can move into modern times. It church, um, as far as church attendance, it was already going down without a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So now it's move with it because God's using and calling those people that understand leadership and know how to reach the masses. And one thing, if we want to admit it or not, this computer, this internet world, it is reaching of the masses. So you either get on or get lost. So it's really pulling out a lot of leaders in the church. So I really like what's happening. With it. I know for myself. Dale, you have a comment? I agree. No, I don't. Patrick? What about you? I know for myself, uh, I look at it as a sociological point of view. And I think that um, traditionally, we, uh, once we get used to doing something, it's hard to change. And this, uh, this virus has changed the way we do things. I mean, I got in a car last week and was headed towards the movies and said, damn. But you know, it just, it changes no the way we do things. And, and um, I think that that's hard. Once you've got a routine, it's hard to break it. Um, yeah, you are risking a lot of things, um, but uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a little bit like future. I'm not as religious, but uh, I can't get to the mosque like I would like to, but I can do and praise right here um, like I am in front of this uh, phone. So um, I can make the adjustments. I've got no problem with it, but I, I do pray for those that have a problem with it. Yes, I just want to chime in. Um, Easter for my family has always been a huge victor deal, like I guess everybody else. And it was funny because we managed to have a water in our family. Uh, so we kind of watch each other. And uh, we always have a, a Easter hat contest in memory of one of my great aunts. And we still did that via pictures. So that was fun. And it was just the interaction. We kind of still kept the inter interaction among our family. So it can be done. You're right. We're in a different uh, era as far as our country. And I don't know what the new norm is going to be. It's definitely not going to be what it was. So, yeah, even, even, so uh, Kevin, even uh, Kevin? Yes. Was someone trying to say something? That was me. I can wait. Go ahead. I would go say, even as go an ahead. actor. Even as an actor, uh, we've had to change the way we do things. Uh, there's a script that I wrote, and we're going to try to uh, produce it via, via this Zoom type uh, technology. Um, we can't be around each other right now, but you know, it, we got a feeling we're still going to make it work. It's changing the way we are and do things, and it's a reality you know, we got to get used to. Uh, Deborah, you uh, well, you know, you're talking about isolation, right? And uh, I have to be honest to say that uh, for me, this isolation has been beneficial, you know, because uh, I commute back and forth, you know, to my job and I've been doing it for so long that it has uh, actually put a strain on my marriage, you know, and because of that, uh, you know, this right here has made me really some things and accept some things and uh, made me look at myself in the mirror. So in the big scheme of things, I'm thinking that for, in, in biblical proportions, I think truly that this is something that God, while God may not uh, created this, I think God is allowing it so that we can draw closer to him because uh, it makes you reflect and, uh, you know, all the things that you have going on in your life, some things that you may have missed out on, some things that uh, you may have taken for granted. Uh, I think it's a, a cause for renewal, you know, some things that, uh, you know, you may have not sat down and focused on saying that maybe I had the opportunity uh, to do some things at one time, but I really kind of look past it. But this, in a way, forces you to sit down. They take away everything socially from us. Uh, 
They've taken, everything has been taken away. You know, we can have all the money in the world, but what difference does it make? Because where can you spend it at right now? What can you do with it? You know, and all these bars and uh, they talk about sporting events and all that. All those things are irrelevant because I think God wants you to draw closer to him. And people have to recognize that uh, I made a post saying that if you don't come out of this situation on the other side of it, God willing, then you actually miss what God uh, was trying to tell you, you know, and that's the way I'm perceiving it. And I'm thankful for this time to be able to reflect and to, to draw closer to family members and to uh, make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in my marriage and all these things that uh, I have made, you know, because I was going a hundred miles an hour, I may have been looking past, you know, and that, so I take it as a blessing and a curse, you know, for me personally. I, I want to piggyback on that with, uh, something related to what Future just said, but also something else. So I've been working from home for about the past three weeks, and so I, I have two. I have two children, and I haven't seen my son in about a month. We've been FaceTiming because I just we didn't want to. I didn't want to just jeopardize him. I don't know if I've been exposed to anything, so I just didn't want to go around him and put him in harm's way. So only communication I've really had with him is like FaceTime, and he's FaceTiming me five or six times a day. So I think he misses me too. <laughs> so uh but so as i as i'm sitting here i'm sitting here watching the news and stuff and it seems like some of it is almost like a dream almost it's like the movies we've seen over the years about these pandemics breaking out and i'm sitting there watching the news and you have president trump saying this and i'm listening to andy Bashir, and then you have everything is on the news but it's like only way i get a break from it is when i'm asleep at night it's, it's the only way you get any refuge from it is when you're asleep but then when you wake up, it's the first thing you get you get you hear about again. And I say that because so I heard uh, I work in city government and I hear what they say, oh, well, we might be doing this for another month. Well, we've already been doing it for a month. so They, they may add an additional month. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, another month. I don't know if I can do it. You know, I don't know if I can do this. And so I'm watching the governor. I've been watching the governor every day at five o'clock. You know, he's giving his, his story and he's telling us about the state of Kentucky or whatnot. And so yesterday I was watching it and I kept, I was saying, what is that noise in the background? Who are these people in the background? The governor's trying to talk. I said, they're being rude. The governor's trying to talk and they're back there shouting. Come to find out it was protesters protesting about starting, opening up the restaurants and stuff back up. So then it became a dime on me. Some people don't even care about lives being lost. It's all about money. And again, to what you said, Future, if, if, you're, if you're dead and gone, what difference does it make how much money you got if you're dead? Right. Can I go back to a medical question with Kevin while we have him on here? Kevin, they were saying that children are super highways for transmitting the virus because most of them are asymptomatic carriers. Is there any truth to that? Because being a grandma, you know, and especially if your child's on the front line working, you want to help out and keep the kids and everything. Should there be a fear for those who are helping out and watching children? Absolutely. It's a great question. Uh, what, I'm looking at the numbers right now. In Lexington, we've only had three out of our 213 cases be in people younger than 18 years of age. So it is not happening in young people, uh, which is good. We, we, we don't want anything to happen to, to the kids, but it's also it can be very dangerous because as you said, it gives children and young people, we're thinking of those college age kids, things back to uh, Four weeks ago, those kids on spring break that you were seeing hitting all the beaches, and we were, we were thinking, why are they doing this? What what's happening? With these young people, think they're invincible to it, and just because they're not showing symptoms, they're carrying it. Then they're going to visit grandma and grandpa, who are uh, my grandmother, for instance. She's 88 years old, has all kinds of underlying conditions. I wouldn't want anybody exposing that to her, and it is tough. We took my I have a 13 month old son. And uh, right after his first birthday, we took him to visit, but she stayed on one side of her glass door and he stayed on the other. There was no, no way that they could breathe on each other and share those terms. It was tough, but I would much rather them visit in that sense than for her to get sick. Thank yeah, so you. I, and I, I think it's something that we really need to reiterate uh, into our communities because uh, myself, I haven't seen my mom or my kids or my granddaughter. We FaceTime, video chat, 
or whatever uh, every other night. But there, I see so many other families who may have, uh, you know, people who are still going to work and then the grandmother's taking care of the kid and they're all in the car. And I just think that they're not realizing the dangers that they're putting themselves in and their families. Well, let me let me say this though, Deborah. I think that some of that is, and it goes back to what Future said earlier. And Kevin, you can chime in because I'd like to for you to talk about what can they do. Sometimes you have no options, right? So what what Trina's saying is, if 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 Mama and Daddy are working and Grandmother's the only one to keep the kids because daycares are closed, there's no access for people to be able to take their kids somewhere. So it does fall on that relative. I would ask Kevin, you know, what well, then what precautions can you take? Because sometimes it's just a must. I don't, I don't think it's much of people are now ignoring um, the CDC guidelines, but I think that people are having to make some decisions, right? If you're a frontline worker, if you're what they call an essential worker, and you have no alternative but to work, and you have to have someone keep your kids, you know, unfortunately, you got to figure that out. So, Kevin, what would you recommend for people that just don't have that option to uh, isolate at home with, 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 their, with their kids or their loved ones, but they have to go out? and they possibly are getting exposed? It's a great question. And before I say that, I want to, it reminds me, you know, it's a, a phrase the governor likes to say and that you've heard uh, get used, and we use it at the health department. We're all in this together. And it, it's, it's true, but it's also can be misleading because that implies that we all come from the same starting point and we know that's not the case. And a big part of what we do at the health department is look at health equity. And if you can allow me just a quick minute to, for the viewers to say health equity is trying to break down the barriers to give everybody the same access to care across the board. The best way it's described to me is equality is taking shoes to a school, but they're all, same, they're all size 12s. Equity is taking size nines, size 12s, size seven and a halfs, and finding the size that fits to each individual. And that's a big part of public health is making sure what works for me works for you, works for Dell, works for Deborah, and that we each have the individualized uh, care. Uh, so that leads into you've got if you've got a family and that uh, mom and dad have to go to work for whatever reason, they're essential workers, they have to be out there. We, we understand that there are going to be cases where not everyone can stay home. So try to close that circle as much as you can. So let's just say that it's grandma who is keeping the kids. You don't want grandma and grandpa going out and doing the grocery runs or, or having the friends come over for dinner on the weekends. You want to try to keep them as cut off as possible in that way. And then the children aren't going and having sleepovers or play dates, that they're going from their home to grandma and grandpa's home. And it's just back and forth. That's the only contact because that's going to keep it as contained as possible. It's the risk you run into though would be me coming to work and then stopping at the dollar store and at the pharmacy and at the grocery store and at the gas station, going to get my kid, then going over to grandma and grandpa's. That would be what would be really dangerous. You wanna to try to keep it as, uh, as close as possible. Yeah, you know, I, I think, um, you know, every day it, it, I, I watch the news, you know, and, and I was, one of those people that was consumed with the news, you know, I like even before this had taken place, you know, I was just tied up on, you know, our leadership uh, in the United States. And so because of that uh, and knowing that he's politically inept, you know, I just stay glued to it all the time. And I, and I recognize the anxiety. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about is the anxiety, because I think that Anxiety right now is at an all-time high. I was listening today that uh, they were talking about that how uh, people now have increased uh, uh, a lot of doctor visits in terms uh, of trying okay. to get more anxiety in medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, this anxiety, you know, of, of watching all of this every day, constantly trying to feel like, you know, what can I do? What should I do? I'm paranoid. I'm being around certain people. Am I really social distancing enough? You know, with my personal situation, you know, I'm, on, I'm a dialysis patient, so I have to go out of the house three times a week regardless. You know, whether I want to go or not, I got to go, and I'm still being exposed to a certain group of people, you know, uh, every three days or every other day, you know, so uh, it's a lot of frustration, it's a lot of anxiety, so I would address the panel with, 
what how are y'all dealing with the anxiety of it or is there really any anxiety because a lot of people say well you know i'm not really having anxiety because i'm leaning on god i lean on god every day but i still have this anxiety and i'm just curious to know how are you all faring with this anxiety that's coming along with this pandemic and knowing that we don't have any real leadership and we don't know what direction we're really going in you know most people do I, i've been in social work for uh, over telling my age 30 years but I suggest to all those, hush it up. I suggest to all of those that talk to me about it is you have to turn it off. You have to turn it off. You have to go find a nice little comedy movie or show. You have to turn it off and take care of your mental health. Turn on music, turn on, because the pandemic is gonna be there when you turn it back on. But there's times you just have to set it up where I gotta turn it off because I have to mentally take care of myself. Because in the um, health field, they're expecting anxiety, depression, PTSD, society, Society, they're looking at a rise in that because of this pandemic, which makes a lot of sense. So I urge everyone that I talk to and deal with and those that still call me and ask to just turn it off and meditate take quiet time, deal with your mental health. Because I've been locked up before for 15 months, so I was taken away from the world, snatched away from the world. That time gave me time to get to know me. So I, I also ask you to get to know yourself, meditate, understand yourself, because when you come out of this, I don't believe the world's gonna be anything like we know it to be. I think we're gonna have a new norm. So to have a new norm and walk into that new norm bravely is to get to know who you are. So take this time, cut off that news and get to know who you are, turn it off. That, that's what I tell them all. Great, great point, Trina. I also will add that um, with that praying and meditating and turning it off, that uh, it is absolutely okay to seek a mental health professional uh, at this time. And I think we have quite a few in this city who are wonderful. Uh, you can also, as Trina stated right now, use her as a resource to find these health professionals to talk to. And I know that we can't go to an office to see people, but my son, um, uh, his, uh, doctor's appointments are online. He talks to a health professional uh, via the computer. And I think we uh, need to make sure that we are telling people in our communities that there is no stigma to that, to talk to your children, to make sure that they are uh, mentally well, as including you. Uh, and, and we have, well, we have now, we have parents that are, that are teaching, going through this pandemic, and they're teaching their children while they're at home as well and trying to do their jobs if they are working from home as well. So I, I see a, a, a huge uh, uptick of people having you know, issues with trying to stay mentally well. But we also have to make sure that we kill that stigma of uh, not being able to seek help and or seeking help beyond the pastors of our church. Exactly. I'll say this for me. Um, that, that's been really huge, talking about um, how do you maneuver through your own mind, right? Being isolated from the things that you like, being isolated from the people that you like, um, and, you know, and, you know, beginning to take inventory, as Future talked about, from the things that you are now separated from. One of the things that I've instituted, and I would highly recommend that everyone does this, is a brother check-in, sister check-in, friend check-in where you're just texting, you know, your family members, you know, and this is a good time where, you know, and a lot of people know me, I don't like to necessarily talk on the phone all the time, but talking to someone for a few minutes is even better than a text, just checking in to make sure that they're okay. Because guess what, everybody's probably not okay. Future's point of anxiety is really high. I mean, you know, I could really make a joke. A lot of us are self-meditating. I mean, medicating, excuse me, you know, alcohol is really gone through the roof. I've looked at some statistics. Um, last week, and it's not being funny, you know, people know me, I'm buying a lot of beer, wine, and bourbon, but, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, you can't mask whatever it is that's there, so I think that checking in with people is essential, and at least having some conversation around people, and maybe it's not everybody, but maybe it's a group text that I do with a couple of my very close friends that I do group texting with every day, thank you, Patrice Muhammad, and uh, Andrea uh, for just our group text that we have on a daily, on a daily, just checking in with people. And, you know, people that I talk to with my best friends, just making sure that people are okay. Because during this time, it, it, it's true. I mean, 
the pandemic is the pandemic. We're in the middle of it. So how we come out of this is where, you know, it's what's going to be our new norm, which is going to be our future. And Joy said something that is very essential for all the people that are listening to this and watching this. Please take time to talk to your kids. If you have kids, even if they're small, talk to them about what's going on. Don't just shove them in a room to a PlayStation or an Xbox. Pull them out. Have some conversations. They have feelings. They have fears. They have concerns. Listen to them. You know, we try to have a family dinner or a, a just, you know, game night or something. You can do that with your kids, you know, no matter if it's via Zoom, if they're far away. But I, I strongly encourage people to at least do some type of a check in um, with, with your friends because, you know, you are right, man. The, the anxiety is high. And, you know, you know, being mindful that there's nothing wrong, you know, in my opinion, with a glass of wine or beer. But let's make sure we're not trying to load up on those um, substances to maybe get away from the reality that we're all in as well. I think we have to be mindful. And in our community, let's be real. We need to talk about that. So if people are utilizing substances a lot more than what they would, please pick up the phone and call your healthcare professional number one. Call a friend. And let's talk about it. I think it's important. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Deborah. Go ahead. Let's take a quick break of future, then we're going to come back and finish this discussion. All right. Thank you. So, okay. We're back. <laughs> that's the quickest break in the world. <laughs> but break. before you, before you uh, go into what you're going to say, future, I want to touch base on the what you said earlier about the anxiety and everything. And those of us who are working from home, I'm working from home again also, but I worked from home, from home back in 2004 for four years. So I kind of got accustomed to things that work for me. So I just want to say those who are working from home, it's a good idea to, when you get up in the morning and how you bathe and you get dressed and you make up your bed or do whatever the daily things that you do before you leave the house, I still continue to do those things. I dress, make up and everything and walk down the hall to my newfound office in my dining room. And then I said I have a timer that I set so that I take my little 15 minute break when I take my lunch. And when at the end of the day, when I'm completed, I'll put my jacket on and I'll get in my car and I'll leave where everybody else is leaving and going home. I'll leave out and take a long drive somewhere away from people these days, but I'll drive out in the country or something, but it's refreshing. It kind of, like you said, it kind of just, you leave the work, you leave the job where it is. I'll even close my door to the to my new office where I don't even look in here anymore to see the papers to frustrate me all over again. So just, just a thought of some things to do if you're working to keep the anxiety down. Yeah, if I go right ahead. On quick is that we had the conversation yesterday from the health department it's uh, on our Facebook page if anybody wants to go back and access it where we talked with Sean Freeman, John Broadus, and Dr. Shamber uh, Mulder about the importance of mental health through this uh, pandemic and in particular they gave a lot of great information on breaking down the stigmas with African Americans as you all were mentioning earlier so it's a really good resource but one thing that John said that really spoke to me was, uh, I love the way he said it, is that self-care is not selfish. So you all are exactly right in saying, take a few minutes. Right now, it feels unnatural to focus on yourself when there's so much of so many other people that need help. But if, if we don't take that time, just even if it's five minutes to put on the, your favorite song or to meditate or to just sit and enjoy the quiet and to feel, you know, to watch the trees as the wind, but whatever it works for you is what's gonna be great. Uh, and, and to not feel bad about doing that because it's exactly what Deborah said. We have to continue taking care of ourselves if we're gonna take care of others and so what we need. That's true. Uh, you know, another thing, excuse me, another thing I was thinking was, uh, you know, with this pandemic being what it is now, if you have a death in your family or you have a friend or something that dies, you can't go to a funeral. You know, it's not like uh, people was uh, initially, you know, you'd have a big funeral, you know, you go to the wake, people have the dead afterwards and all of that. Now, either you, you might have to be doing it this way that we're doing it now with, with Zoom or they're only going to have so many people that's allowed. So 
I think it's important that you let people know how you care about them or how much you care about them and you have that interaction with people as much as you can. And 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 uh, like you said, if group text, uh, Zoom, whatever you can do, because if something happens where somebody dies, it's not going to be traditional anymore. You know, you got to, it's, it's going to hurt you not to be able to go and, or if somebody's even in the hospital, you can't even go in the hospital. They are dying alone. These people are dying alone out here. I mean, it's a whole lot that's going on. So when you talk about the new normal, we have to, you know, make ourselves adjusted to this new normal. Cause I think when it comes out on the other side of this thing, again, I don't think the world is going to be the same. You know, I think we can forget about what was, you know, hugging, handshaking, all of that is things of the past. I don't, I don't even see that happening anymore. And that's well, how we I'm really- I'm not going to be that pessimistic future. I, I hope that we get not only a vaccine, I hope that we get a cure, um, but we'll take a vaccine. And I, I hope that we don't, I, I think there, there's something, for me, there would be something unnatural. And I, we've talked about this before. Me and Joy have talked about this before. It would be unnatural for me not to be able to shake someone's hand or for me not to be able to get someone a hug. And I hope that because of this, we don't, we don't miss that, right? I'm hoping we come out and there's something on the other side where maybe we do that more. But you're right, it may be some time in between that we can't, but I'm just hoping, man, that we get back to some sense of normalcy because, I mean, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I, my dad is, is ill, a lot of people know that. And the fact that I can't see him right now has been probably the most heart-wrenching thing for me and my brothers and my sisters. Like we can't physically go to him because he's battling cancer. And so right. we don't want to expose him. But, you know, if, if we couldn't hug or shake hands or something like that, I, I don't know. I don't know what that would do. I'm already isolated now. So now my, you just raised my anxiety level future. Now I'm thinking about coming out of this in a couple of months that we couldn't, you know what I'm saying, Dale, that we couldn't. I, I'm looking forward to being at the barbershop brother and dapping you up. I mean, I am. that. I'm looking forward, that, forward to that day. We hear right, I talk right. about that all the time. I look forward to coming to the barbershop to sit down and just chill out. I mean, so right. you better take some acting lessons, man. Don't throw you better take some acting lessons from man. Patrick so he can yeah. show you how to do it with your smile and with yes, your right. eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick, with his blessings. I'm telling you that hugging and that hugging and kissing and I mean, unless you get your significant other, but anybody outside of that, you know, your family, I don't see a whole lot of that going on now. I just really don't. Maybe, and and I'm like you, I'll miss it to death, you know, of course, but I mean, because I'm one of those kind of people, I like a hug and, you know what I mean, a death, like you say, but now, I mean, the, the paranoia is so high, you know, yeah. that you're like, wow, you know, so, so I don't know, but it, it, it's just crazy, man, and, but, you know, another thing that you were, you were talking about, you know, you said a vaccine. Now, let me talk about that vaccine for a second. A lot of people, are paranoid about a vaccine. Yeah, you know, because are, now it's not only always, black people, future. A lot of people. No, it's, it's not, not only black people. people. Don't do it. No, it's not yeah. only black people. Mm -mm. I'm thinking it's people. Period. You know, because people uh, don't want to be guinea pigs. You know, we don't want to go back to the Tuskegee Project. You know, experiment. You know, and say well with black people. But I'm thinking that this vaccine is coming along. You know, Trump is trying to rush it. You know, a lot. They said they got like 70 different uh, vaccine trials going on right now. Uh, I don't know if I want to take a vaccine because I don't know six months down the road they give you a vaccine and who knows what might happen to you after that. So it's a lot of things going on with this vaccine. I don't know if I'm excited about a vaccine. Uh, Kevin, could you, could you speak to that with uh, uh, future concerns about the vaccine and whatever these urban myths or other stories you've heard about vaccines? Well, it's a tough one because the historical perspective on it is I understand why he's got some concerns, uh, particularly as an African American. But as he said, it's not just African Americans. There are a lot of people who are afraid of the vaccine uh, or the thought of a vaccine. One of the problems that this country faces right now, though, is there's so much conflicting information. And it has been what was said, what gets said in one press conference nationally on today might be different than what is said tomorrow. And we try to look to, it's why we're trying to establish what I can see in Lexington. You listen to Governor Bashir, listen to Mayor Gordon, and listen to your health department, and listen to Dr. Stephen Stack, the Commissioner of Health, also at the state level, Dr. Humboldt here in Lexington, because we, I know that the information we are giving is good. 
and I know that we are, are trying our best to, to suss out what's rumor and fact or rumor and myth. Uh, it's it's a challenge as a public health communicator because there is so much misinformation and distrust, and it's understandable not only from what has happened years ago, but what's happened probably just even minutes ago of why there's so much confusion. You all you have, you've hit it here with 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 the concerns, but listening to the people that you know and trust, like what we're doing here today, this goes a long way toward build, to, to letting people know what the actual truth is. I know I didn't answer your question. That's because I really can't, because there's uh, it's speaking just in a hypothetical on that vaccine. Kevin, can you talk to us more about how long viruses last on various surfaces while we still have a moment with our audience? Yeah. Um, I mean, and specifically with COVID, um, yes. I'm trying to see right now if there were, uh, I don't have in front of me the exact hours that it takes or how long it lasts on it. Uh, what, what, I've, what I've done in my own practice at home is like bringing things from the grocery that don't have to go into the refrigerator. We box up and put, put out of the way. And a couple of days later, you can, you can put those where they need to go without fear. The good thing about COVID-19 is it's pretty easy to kill in your home that you can use. So you frequently touch surfaces, your tables, doorknobs. You can use regular household detergent and water. You don't necessarily have to go get, it's hard to get Lysol wipes or the Clorox wipes, for instance. But if you do have bleach and can mix that with water, that will help as well. Uh, it's what's interesting about COVID-19 is that it is so highly contagious but it is still easy to kill. What about clothing? You know, there's rumors and things about how long it stays on your clothing and, and your shoes and how you should come into your home from the outside. Could you expound on that a little bit? It's, uh, it's gonna be one of those kind of non-answers because I really don't know. I, I've seen the same things probably you have that maybe now it's, trans, it's being transmitted from the soles of your feet or from, you know, spreading from the shoes. Uh, I will, if it makes you feel comfortable to take your shoes off when you walk in the home, go for it, do that. Uh, we do know like wearing masks though, you don't wanna wear those multiple days in a row. If you have that mask, whether it's a homemade one or you've bought one, wash it after each use and be careful taking it off. You don't wanna bring it and rub it across your face. You wanna take it out this way. Uh, but when you do wash things, uh, you know that hot water or the water and the soap can kill the virus. Uh, and one that you didn't ask this, but I will go ahead and mention it too. It comes up often on interviews. What about ordering takeout or delivery or That's food outside your home? It's uh, what, what I do in my own private world is I'll take it out of the containers and I either put it on another plate and get rid of the container, wash my hands for 20 seconds with soap and water and then eat. And if you're concerned about maybe the food not being, being safe, uh, we've been told, uh, or I understand, you can put, put it in the microwave, zap it for 20 seconds, and that can kill anything that's on it. It's going to be really hard to catch something that way. It's going to be more of the face-to-face -face and the shared equipment, like shared microphones, shared um, gro you know, uh, grocery carts. That's why they're wiping them down in places. Kevin, i got a quick question before we lose you. So you're at the health department, and you know we see you around. You guys give the the uh, scores to restaurants, you know, seeing you there often. So what do you think the health department's role will be once they begin to ease some of the social restrictions? Do you get, do you, will you guys still then go into restaurants um, and still do that type of testing? Do you think it will expand um, beyond just the, I don't know if it's the cleanliness rating or whatever it is that you guys give. Do you guys think you'll have a, a more pronounced role with COVID for restaurants? Well, hopefully it will be more of a noticeable role because public health is the great unknown. Uh, people don't think about the health department until they need the health department. And you think back a couple of summers ago when there was the norovirus outbreak out at the food court and everybody knew how to reach the health department then, probably didn't think about the health department otherwise. Same thing with uh, COVID. Um, we, our anticipation would be to continue doing our restaurant inspections. They happen at least twice a year and they're still going on, but not to the degree of what they are in a normal time. If what right now we're responding to complaints. So if somebody does see an issue at a restaurant, we receive a complaint, we look into it. And also our restaurants that are on probation, 
uh, we, work, we continue the inspections with them because our goal, our hope is to get them off of probation to continue operating uh, as, as regular. Now, and so let me, let me kind of clarify, my apologies. Would, if someone was exposed to COVID that worked at a restaurant, somewhat like someone oh, that had hepatitis, do you guys anticipate that you all will list that so that the public would be aware? That you can tell by my, if you saw my reaction, I don't, I've not thought of that. I've not, that's not come up. That's a good question. It's not one I would even hesitate to make a guess on, but I could, uh, what well, we could have a talk about that. I'm not sure if that would be. It really just depends on what the public health risks would be and what the determination is on that. So uh, this is not about uh, the health department, but I was still curious to know uh, how you all feel about what's going on with the people that are incarcerated and mm. how uh, yeah. people yeah. that, uh, you know, you, you have these people that are, you, we talk about these closed quarters. It's a lot of people that are in closed quarters that, uh, you know, these nonviolent offenders, I think that really should be let out of jail. How do y'all feel about that? Because a lot of us, you know, African-Americans, you know how the penal system has so many millions of African-Americans, you know, we populate, uh, you know, these prisons probably more than anybody, uh, black and brown people. So, uh, how do you feel about them uh, in a lot of places now, you know, Andy Bashir has talked about it, but in a lot of places they have not even been talked about or not even been addressed. So I'm just curious to know, how do you all feel about that? And if they do have it, say, say they do let them out, you know, I mean, and they test them or they test them before they let them out because if they do let them out and they come back out here in society, are they infecting people? So, I mean, how do y'all feel about that? There is a 14 day quarantine prior to release. Okay, it's yeah. a fourteen-day quarantine prior to and, release. And I would, I would press to everyone to be the advocate for your loved one in there. If you have a loved one that's incarcerated, and you know they have a lot of the underlying issues that we speak of, that um, COVID hits hard, definitely be an advocate. And you want to write your local governor, um, your local. Um, um, they have your counselors in federal prisons. You want to write and advocate for your loved one, because I truly believe it's the squeaky wheel that gets it's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. But also, you want to bring to the attention that you have a loved one. When you have 2.7 million people incarcerated, you want to bring to the attention that you have a loved one that suffers from those underlying diseases that COVID can strike at any time. So my thing is just be an advocate for that loved one. Yeah, absolutely. I, I live that every day. I have a son that is incarcerated right now. And so when I read the things about Green River Correctional, it, you know, that's another anxiety uh, thing for me as well. Talking to him, I believe just a few days ago, he said that they have masks now. So look at all that time that they went without one. Right. Um, I think my son even said that there may have been one case uh, of an employee of course, this is just something you know he's speaking about. I'm not sure if he even has that information. I'm not sure if these institutions are required to give uh, that information. I'm not sure if even people are concerned about hey. individuals that are incarcerated. So right. um, yeah, that's that's this is an everyday thing for myself and an everyday thing for Trina as well. That um, this is something that yeah we have to advocate for our children. I. I know now they are giving masks out, uh, and of course, there's no visitation, so they are giving a free phone call to uh, inmates and um, a couple of free extra stamps as well. So there, there's a little bit of work being done uh, to make sure that uh, they are able to stay in touch uh, with their family members, but as far as safety is concerned, I'm not at all convinced that um, enough work is being put in to protect individuals that are in incarcerated who deserve to live just like we are deserving of living and, and having a safe uh, space. Uh, but I'm not sure if, 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 if we are really uh, taking notice of that, if we are really putting any attention to uh, people that are are incarcerated. There's a little bit of stuff being done. I, I get it, but I'm I'm concerned that we may very well see the more of uh, you know these Green River situations where many people are very very sick and and getting infected. And I'm almost sure I'm not sure Trina if you could tell me if anyone has died for, at, at Green River. 
I'm not really sure. Green River, there's been, I haven't seen any evidence of anyone dying, but oh, yes. again, okay. to pat our governor on the back, um, they are now taking temps for the guards that come in and out of the facilities. Temperatures, yes, slow, but done. Temperatures are now being taken for guards that enter and exit the prison systems. So that helps. And they're starting to quarantine and clearing out areas for those that are testing positive, where they have a place to put them at and separate the pods. So again, it's, it's, it's crazy because it's an, a, a petri dish. You know, when you talk about our prisons, there's no six feet distancing unless you're in. And, you know, let me say, it really disturbs me sometimes when people say being quarantined in their home is like being in prison. You have no idea. It's no. nothing like being That's in right. prison. That, yeah. that comment is almost so offensive. It's, it's ridiculous. Where we need to start counting our blessings that we have a home that we can walk through and be quarantined and be safe and choose what we choose. Yeah. We have loved ones that don't have that opportunity, but I'm not going to get on this soapbox, Deborah. I'm just saying, okay. always be an advocate, stay in touch with your loved one. They need you more than ever. We can get on that soapbox, and yeah, I, I'd rather, yeah, no, okay, but but but, but yes, <laughs> uh, you know, hold me back as well. But 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 yes, anybody okay, who let's, says let's, that is, is bad. It's, let's take let's take another quick break here. We're <laughs> almost running out of time. It's like yeah, seven thirty-three, <laughs> and we're gonna be here to eight o'clock. She so, means quick. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to jump in here and say that the reason that we're doing these little breaks is so when we broadcast this on the radio, Deborah is helping me know where to put the, the breaks that go in on the radio. So that's why it's happening. And I just want to jump in as well and say how happy I am to have all of these hosts, because even Kevin is a host of a show on Radio Lex. And it's, it's so awesome. And when... Um, Joy was talking about her different ways that she was getting her Sunday fix. We have CJ Akins and the Ultimate Praise Party on Sunday morning. And, and it's times like these where I'm so just wowed by what Radio Lex can do for the community because you can turn in and hear voices of people you know. It's not like watching the, the scary news with anchors or hearing people. And with some people talking about the... Um, you know, as human beings, we're very social creatures. It's important for us to interact with each other and nobody likes unexpected change. Everybody has to struggle with that. And what strikes me is there's a, there seems to be a whole lot of confusion at the national level on what's going around with the administration and everything there. And we've really, the, the motto that we have in Lexington of we're all in this together is, is really truer than ever because it's, it's each other. It's those of us here. We have to take care of each other because we don't really even have confidence that it's happening <laughs> that well on a higher level. So it reaching out to each other, having a local health department that's willing to sit down. I mean, it's, it's so important and we're very lucky here. And I am just so grateful as the manager of Radio Lex to have all of you involved and thank you for being here. And Deborah, that should be enough of a break. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey Deborah, I got a question for you. Go for the panel, uh, I, I would like for everyone to kind of tell me, like, when we're out of quarantine, what is the one thing that you're going to do when you get out of quarantine? And this the first thing? You know, it ain't got to be the first thing, but what is one thing you, you're just like, I cannot wait to go do this? I just I was curious. Everybody could just go around the room. Well, for me, the first thing I'm going to do is, is pray, you know, like I do every day and be thankful. You know, I'm, I'm going to definitely do that because... Again, being such a high risk person, you know, what I'm saying it's going to be tough for me, you know, to uh, I mean, I'm just having to try. I just want to make it to the other side of it. And but when I get out, I'm gonna go see my family. I mean, because like you said, all of this, uh, you know, the social thing, you know, where uh, we could do the Zoom and we could do the group text and we could do all that, man. But, you know, I, I want to, you know, see my mother. I want to see my brothers and sisters, you know, and and my kids. And, you know, what I mean, I want to be able to be up close to because I have grown kids. You know, you got young kids, but, you know, you right around them. But I got young kids, I mean, a grown kid. So, you know, I got to be concerned about if something happens to one of my kids who's in another state. I mean, I know I can't go see them. You know, I know I got if, if something happens to I mean, that's a lot of pressure. So as soon as I get done with this, my first thing is going to go address my kids and my family. You know, I want to see my family for sure. Anything else is superficial, you know, go to a restaurant, go to a bar, watch a sporting event or whatever. I mean, I could do that anytime, but 
it's about, you know, me linking up with my family. Uh, for me, um, the first thing I'm going to do is go see my sister. And I'm sitting here listening to you, Future, trying not to shed any tears. But the hardest thing about this for me has been my sister being in a nursing home and unable to see her. And right. she's nonverbal, so I can't call her on the phone. Um, we did have, we have had a couple of times where we've been able to go to her window. Her bed was by the window and been able to see her that way. But um, that's the most difficult thing. And that will be the first place I go is to go see her. I think the first, the first thing I would do is uh, I'd go see my son and give him a big hug so I can hear his voice and, and tell, to hear him tell me, daddy, I want to give you a hug. So future, I don't think the hugging will be out. When we get back, right? <laughs> so you're gonna do it anyway, regard. Yeah, I'm just saying, but yeah. Well, I, when I said it though, I was talking about you know outside your immediate family and and people you are more familiar with. But though you know, just seeing people in passing and giving them dap and what's up and all that, I don't know if that's gonna be the norm anymore. What's up with you, Kevin? What you gonna do? <laughs> well. Before I get into that, I want to say that I really, for people who are watching this or listening to this, the reason that we are putting these social guidelines in place is for people like Deborah's sister. And so when you are thinking, why is this such a lockdown? It is, it is because it's the people who are the most vulnerable like that. And it is to, for anybody who can hear Deborah talk. I mean, I've got tears in my eyes and the, and the hair is standing up on my arm hearing her fight that back because she can't make that contact at all and it's why we are doing this so please please if you're listening if we even reach one person to understand this is this is why we're doing it and it is it is not to take away your rights or to take anything away from you it is to protect the people like her sister so thank you for sharing that deborah uh outside of finding future and hugging him which was going to happen <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to do two things. The one in Lexington is I'm going to show up at each of your radio shows and thank you for this because this is amazing. I listen. I've heard y'all's voices on air. It's great to talk to you, and it'll be great to come in and thank you personally for what you've done. But I'm going to follow the trend. I'm going to go see my grandmother. She is 88 years old, and earlier uh, in January, my grandfather, her husband of 74 years, died. And so she is not only going through this isolation, she's doing it as a new widow. And, but she's doing what Deborah said earlier, she gets up every morning, she, she cleans herself, she gets dressed, she does her hair, because she's taking care of herself to go on. I'm gonna hug her and then let her push me so far out of the way to get to my 13 month old son. And I will be happy and tickled for her to do that. Mm. So you're gonna stop by and pick up a kiss. That's good. I like that. Um, why are you laughing, though? I, uh, in the last, since the beginning of the year, I've lost two very close friends, um, one to pneumonia and one to, uh, to cancer. Um, and I've been calling all my close friends um, for the last two months anyway, catching up. And this has made me think more about it. And so I guess the first thing I'm going to do is go see my grandkids, because I've also realized especially listening in the future, that uh, I wasn't visiting as much as I should have. I let life get in the way and I was taking it for granted. So that'll probably be one of the first things I do. Yeah. Let me go ahead and add a little bit of comic <laughs> relief here, I guess, because uh, I'm like, I'm going to do the same things you all are doing, family members and friends and all of that. But as a single woman, I'm here to tell you the same too. I, I'm struggling. Uh, and um, sometimes it's not real good and fun to be um, a single woman during this pandemic. I'm all right, but I just want to be for real with, with everybody that, um, yeah, may, maybe I'll focus a little bit more on, on dating and uh, having a little bit more fun. I've listened in to your radio, so I, I, I can't wait to hear what happens when you, when you start tackling this on air. Right, and you know, and you know, Kevin, we're that's going to be it. We're going to tackle this on there. I'm remembering yeah. that one, Joy. I you can't know, wait. Me, oh, I can't wait either. For me, what you going to do, Zell? First thing I'm going to do, man, is drive to Louisville 
and go hug my dad, man. Yeah. That, that, that is something that is, um, my dad is very, um, he's a big influence in my life. And, you know, like I said, to be for him battling cancer right now, for us not to be able to have that interaction, to be able to be there with him, going to go and kiss him, man. Just go and kiss him and hug him and um, sit out back and have a beer. And then the second thing is, <laughs> which I miss, you, get a haircut. So you know this, I'm right. I'm going to some <laughs> restaurant where they can ask me, what is your order? And I can tell them, you know, whatever the hell I want. And I just keep bringing me drinks. That's what I want. So that's the second thing. Yeah. After I go yeah. and hug that old man. Hmm. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Anyone else? Trina? Yeah. What you going to do, Trina? Oh, I'm going to take a vacation from my children. <laughs> <laughs> Between being a teacher, a chef, a maid, a referee, uh, we taking a vacation. We have a different relationship than I've had with any of my children. You said you and just leave them, Trina. You just going somewhere. I need time without my children. Just a little bit of time because I love my yeah. baby. Yeah. And I'm going to send every teacher an apple. Because they've done a wonderful thing. Because this Amen. right here, I'm not cut out for, but we make it happen. But that's definitely the first thing I'm doing. So what we we only like uh what, what three, maybe almost four weeks into uh this uh quarantine thing. So oh, you try try uh it's six weeks. Four weeks. You, you, no, it, I ain't no six weeks. Say to Kentucky you, four weeks. Yeah, like four weeks at Kentucky. I thought it was March the thirteenth that we three. started. Yeah, so it, yeah, it's, it's been like three, almost four, something like that. Uh, but what happens? But but what happens? But what happens if it goes to like December? You know, I mean, because we at this point of this, you know, Dude, stop being the Grim Reaper, man. It's not going. To I'm not December, being the man. Grim Reaper. Please stop. Listen, I am. I am the ultimate. Op well, I can't say I'm the ultimate optimist because my co-host is the <laughs> ultimate optimist. You know, but I, I'm saying that I, have we prepared ourselves mentally? No. You know that this could, this particular, because they're talking about a second wave potentially, you know? So what I'm saying is, have we prepared ourselves mentally to be able to quarantine ourselves for another, what, five, six months? Kevin, what do you think about that second wave? What you yeah. know? Yeah. I, I, what you know? I think that it's something we have to be prepared for. It is, and it's something that we anticipate. And it's not only the second wave, it's the third wave, the fourth wave. Uh, I, the way that it has been talked about in public health circles, you've seen it on TV, and uh, is that anticipate there being some phased openings, uh, but until there is a vaccine, we wouldn't be able to fully reopen and go back to business. It could be uh, like uh, Dr. Fauci, is how, is how he says, what he has said is that you open for a bit and then you close back down for a bit. Um, and to answer what Future said, no, we are not mentally prepared because we're not mentally prepared to handle four weeks of it. We can't even, time has no meaning for us. We have no idea how much we've been, we've been doing this already because it feels like six months. Yeah. Most like, yeah. Um, but one, to, to say that though, to stress though, when, you, when it does open up, we do ask people continue following those guidelines so that way we don't have to go back to the strict intense lockdown right right away let's build back into it and gradually get into it to protect people uh, and to know that public health officials decision number one is to protect the public on this it won't open back up for an economy or for economic reasons because if everyone is sick and dying the economy is going to suffer anyhow it's about looking at the human costs of it and that's really where the decision making lies well you should tell that to the president because that's what, you know, because the, the president is, is is dead set on opening up, you know, and I think he's getting a lot of pressure from, from his cohorts, you know, and he really is not considerate of people's lives. I mean, if we saying it now, only 70 days behind everybody else, that's why we've had such a high number of uh, fatalities as it is. So but at the end of the day, you know, I, I just think it's crazy that, you know, this, we have, you know, it's another thing is we have to make sure that we're not duped and missing out on this election thing. Because I, I think personally, I think the fix is in, you know, even with this with this pandemic. And I think that ultimately something's gonna happen where he's gonna try to uh, disrupt the process. And we have to be prepared for that. Yeah, but let, let's go back to 
to to opening up the economy because I, I think it is important. I, I am I'm a person that believes um, that we can't go for six months. I mean, our economy, honestly, is we're not built like that. And I'm not saying anything wrong. We're not weak. But the American economy is not built that way. We're we're not in a socialist society. We you know, some people got a stimulus. Some people did. not Some people out of work. So we're, we're, we have an economic engine that really does dictate that people work. So I'm not knocking him for saying that we should not go back to work. I think we should go back to work, you know, cautiously listening to the health experts. But, you know, we, I think we have to be mindful, you know, even if it were another three or four months, you know, man, there are going to be a lot of people who, who, who will not have jobs when, the, when this is over. There'll be a lot of businesses that will not reopen. So I think that there is a fine line that we all have to understand. We can't, we really can't afford to be out of work for four or five, six months. I mean, you know, there's nobody putting a stimulus check in, you know, in our bank account every two or three weeks. So some people got it, some people didn't. So I think it's a fine line. I want us to be safe. I want us to stagger it in, man. But I think we have to be mindful that if it did go, like you said, till the end of the year, I think you're not even looking at a, a, a depression, man. I think it's even worse than that. I think it would be it would be detrimental to to the American society, man. It would be horrible. I mean, people would lose homes, businesses, jobs, because at some point, you know, how do you get out and, and take care of your family? And I think that's something we have to look at. But you saying that? Uh, uh, you say okay, let me let me interject. Please here for a yes. second because our time is our time is running out. I'm gonna give everyone uh, on the final comment uh some time you can take one minute and say your final comment kevin i'd like for you to, to be the last one if you don't mind <laughs> okay joy oh yes ma'am i'll say one final thing I, I i wanted to say thank you to kevin for taking the time i saw him on earlier so uh he is absolutely uh being uh, participating in, in the discussion that's going on in our community I also want to give a shout out to Electropolis, and I'm not sure, Deborah. I'm sure you're going to say something about it, but uh, the Electropolis is a Facebook page that gives great information about uh, what is going on. So I think uh, we need to make sure that we utilize that page uh, to have information. We are partnering with the health department, um, talking with community action. We need to make sure that we get the right information out there that is going to help uh, people win utilities are due, when rent is due and all of that, uh, we need to make sure that we have some kind of space where people can go directly to and get actual facts, you know, about uh, what's going on. Also, I got to give a shout out to, to my radio show, The Joys and Lows of Relationships. Check us out. We're going to be doing something like this and get back on the air. I miss it. I love radio and I can't wait to get back to talking about relationships and how this thing uh, is, is affecting me and other single folks. Lazelle. <clears throat> yes. So um, let me thank, you know, uh, Deborah and Dale for the invitation. Thank you, Kevin, for your insight, uh, Trina and Future. And uh, Patrick, we thank you guys just for joining to being a part of this. Um, for me in parting, you know, um, this is serious. This is serious business, what we're all facing right now. This is not a joke. Um, I just ask that people take this seriously, protect yourself, um, but also protect your family members and your friends. Um, as our governor says, we're gonna get through this, but we're only gonna get through this together. And um, you guys just, you know, keep at it. You know, we see the end, the end is in sight and um, you all stay safe. And um, we hope to see you guys out here uh, in the near future. I appreciate you all. Patrick? Uh, yes, I want to thank um, everybody once again. And if you're out there, we were doing this for the community. Community, you got questions, call Kevin at home. I'll give you his phone number. Um, <laughs> and get the information and just do what you can. And if you got to get together, be responsible, please, because it's not just about your life. It's about the people around you. And make sure you stop by and pick up a kiss on the kiss of life. Uh, I want to thank the Lextropolis. Like uh, Joyce said, I want to thank Radio Lex for doing this. And Kevin and the health department, once again, thank you for stopping by, picking up your kiss. 
Trina. So sorry, guys, I sitting here on mute. I want to thank you all for the invite, uh, Conversations Around the Table, Radio Lex. It's always good to be back at, at home. Uh, thank everyone for joining me on this panel. I just want to say to my people, my community, to take care of yourself. Enjoy each other. Um, there's ways to do it. Have a happy hour with your girlfriends via FaceTime, via GroupMe, via Google Meet. Have a good good time with each other that way. Be able to take care of yourself. Enjoy, hey, I got some good ones. I'm enjoying Instagram, like I'm a music lover. So the battles and the DJing is just really taking me to another level of peace. So enjoy that. Take care of each other and take care of yourself, more importantly. And thanks again for the invite, guys. Future? Um. You know, I just want to say to everybody, thank you. Thank you to Radio Lex. Uh, thank you to Kevin and the health department and everybody on the panel. You know, all of y'all are personal friends of mine and, and I appreciate you, all of you all. Uh, I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, we had a little bit of urban conversations as a part of this, you know, and I want to thank you personally, Deborah, for inviting me and, you know, the people on the panel because this was very much needed uh, for our community. Uh, but I just wanted to say, you know, some of the things what I was listening to Lizelle saying before we get out of here, or well, he was talking about uh, that the economy, uh, you know, we can't hurt our economy. The economy can't go on for this long, you know, because it's going to be even worse than depression. But I just want you to think about the fact that, you know, despite the economy, you know, I have to place uh, life over everything. And because of that, you know, yeah, I want the economy to come back and I do value some of these things and these material things that I have or whatever. But at the end of the day, we you know we have to supersede this uh, uh, mindset about uh, things and put more focus on our lives and understand how serious this situation is. And it's a pandemic and uh, it's telling you every day, statistics are showing that uh, African-Americans are being disproportionately targeted by this uh, disease. So I think it's imperative that we focus on trying to uh, get the information out to people, make them understand uh, that this is a real situation. Yeah, we want to get back to work. We want to put the economy up. But at the end of the day, we want to come out of this unscathed if we can. So again, I appreciate the opportunity and I will continue to try to uh, share my insight and information that I have about this to my community. Thank you. And my co part, Dale. I just want to say thank all of y'all for, um, for signing in today and everybody who's actually listening and uh, uh, obviously for, for all of our panel, the panelists here. But I would just like to say, uh, I, hear, I hear a lot of people saying about, can't wait for it to get back to normal. But I would say, I would charge you with trying to get better than what normal was when, when all of this, when all the smoke does clear. Because uh, I know there are a lot of things, you know, we're running around, we're, we're working two or three jobs, you, you got the kids, you're doing this. But during this time, I, I've been kind of working from home from, for about a month. But I've been able to get some things done, as Deborah, as Deborah knows, and some things that I've been wanting to get into. And I've just taken this time to do those things. So when we do get back to normal, I'm, I have something else going on that, that could better help me, my family, and maybe even the community. So I would just say, use this time as a, something to get yourself to a, a better a better sense of normal when we do come back. Okay, Mr. Kevin Hall. Uh, I'm sorry, before you start, uh, Mark, did you wanna say something? Well, I'll just jump in and say again how great it's been to, you know, I, I get to hear everybody's voices when I edit stuff to put it on the radio, but to be here with you all is, is awesome. Um, I do want to let everybody know one of the things we're doing during this at Radio Lex is we are making information available in over 20 languages for our folks in the community who don't speak English. And there are over 185 languages spoken in Lexington. But that said, if you go to Radio Lex slash COVID, all that information is there in English too. So if you need good resources, uh, I'm glad to hear the Lextropolis is doing stuff, but please check out that website and, and please tell anybody you know who may not speak English or who's looking for help for somebody who doesn't speak English, send them our way. And then personally, I'll wrap up by saying, I belong to um, a fellowship, I'll, I'll say, and one of the things that we say in that fellowship uh, all the time is one day at a time. 
And that is really the way to kind of, that I've been handling the life as it is, is I, I try not to get ahead of myself. I know that if I tell myself stories about what's going to happen next, what's going to happen in the future, that that just ratchets up my anxiety. And like Trina said, when the news gets to be too much, I turn it off because nobody really knows what's going to happen next. We all have to live through it. We all have to support each other. And so that's that's kind of been my mantra is one day at a time. And that's it for me. Thanks. Awesome. Kevin. Uh, first thing I want to say is as a public health official is to keep washing your hands 20 seconds with soap and water, follow the social distancing guidelines, stay at least six, six feet away from others when you go out and don't go out unless you absolutely have to. Uh, but from a personal standpoint, I'm also uh, I'm a human, I am, and I'm not just going to be someone who's going to echo and keep saying the talking points you've heard us say in public health. Uh, one of the things you heard tonight is about the new normal, and I think on a personal belief is I think the new normal is a lot going to be what we make of it when we come out of this. And I, it, it makes me feel really good to be a part of Lexington because I've been able to witness some of the best of Lexington come out of this right now. People checking on each other and caring for each other and talking to each other. I've talked to, not counting Mark, I've talked to two of you before today, and I have enjoyed meeting virtually all of you and look forward to future discussions with each of you because this is now, this has put us in a situation of where we have been forced to talk, but now we're getting to know each other better. And it's, uh, and I think let's do that a little bit more in our lives. Let's reach out to some people. We may make new friends, make new contacts. Um, I want to thank each of you for your questions and taking this information back out to your friends, your family, your colleagues. I can say with certainty that this discussion tonight, each of you has changed lives and I can assure you that you have saved lives. If one person listens to this and follows the guidelines and benefits from it, you have made that difference. Uh, I'm also, music is my great escape. That's how I uh, listen, that's what I do to calm myself in this and there's a band I love called Wilco and I keep going back to this one line from a song and it is our love is all we have and I thank you all for sharing your love with the people of Lexington. Thank you for that and I want to thank everyone for joining uh, come around the table. This has been phenomenal. I was kind of nervous, didn't know what to expect, but I'm glad that we did this and I hope that our communities, all the communities, not just the black and brown communities, are taking heed and listening and I hope we have educated them or given them something to think about because this is, right now, this is what where we are in our state of uh, the country. Um, and I'd like to thank you, Kevin, personally uh, for my daily emails <laughs> my uh, partnership with the health department and Mark, you as well. We got so we are daily staying in contact also. But um, to Joy, to Lazelle, to Patrick, Dale, uh, Trina, Future, I truly appreciate you guys being a part of this panel. And with all that being said, also check out the Lexitropolis. Yes, that's the plug. But our April issue has a lot of information in there about COVID 19. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to any one of us, and we'd be sure to try to get the answers to you. Thank you for joining us. And again, you have listening or have been tuned in to Conversations Around the Table. Have a good night. Good night, y'all. Good night. <laughs> See y'all.